Event Horizon is a 1997 science fiction horror film directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, starring Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Kathleen Quinlan, Jolie Richardson, and more. Captain Miller! I've got some problems here! This ship has been beyond the boundaries of our universe. Who knows where it's been? And what it's brought back with it. You can't leave. She won't let you. God help us. And welcome back to the Cult of Films. I have Mr. Tony Walters and Mr. Johnny Mulligans here. We are traveling Deep Space Nine to the, I don't know, moons of Neptune because we are going back to 1997 to pull out a gem. That's right, we're talking about the allegorical science fiction horror film, Event Horizon. Welcome, Tony and Johnny. Thanks for having me again, John. It's bliss. <laughs> now, this is one that I think we all were pretty excited about doing. This came out, I, I think we're all around the same age, give or take a few. So, mm -hmm. I... For me, Event Horizon came out in junior high. I think I was in seventh grade. And this was such a to-do, like a group of friends and I. This was like a, it was almost like a dare that we do. We'd be like, okay, you got to, have you seen Event Horizon yet? And then like, we'd, we'd like go home and we'd rent it or whatever at Blockbuster. And then we'd get real freaked out. Like this was, I, I don't want to say like my big introduction to horror because at this point I had already watched like, you know, Halloween and, and all the Friday the 13th and all that stuff. But this was the first time watching a film that I actually felt terrified as as a movie viewer. And I actually like lost sleep as, as a child. When did you guys first find Event Horizon? Was it as affecting when you saw it for the first time? I don't think I saw it on release date. I think. I think I saw it in like a DVD or as a rental, like a rental DVD or something in the early 2000s, I think is where I came across it. I have fond memories about the movie being like one of those like good suspense kind of things, like a sci-fi suspense thriller where you don't see the big bad ugly because it's all around you. Like that was... That was one of the draws for me. That's part of the reason I really like this. And it was interesting going back to rewatch it with that critical eye. Cause that's, I was able to go and nitpick things out. Yeah, for me, I don't think I have the nostalgia that you have for it. I remember the movie from like when I was a kid, I, there's definitely images from this film that are trapped in my brain of like Sam Neill, like ripping his face open and like <laughs> stuff like that, that is just buried in there. And it was probably, I don't know, probably about five or six years ago, actually, that I watched the movie as an adult, like since seeing it as a kid. But I don't think I ever really like watched the movie. I think I like saw parts of it as a kid and probably wasn't allowed to watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, so or I was just scared and hid. I had a thing when I was a kid that scary. I didn't watch scary movies. I really they, I did not like them. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I went back and started watching things. Yeah. Uh, but this is a, a movie for me that watching it as an adult, there's a lot of things that I like about it, a lot of things that I don't like about it. But uh, ultimately, I think it's Anderson's best movie. <laughs> 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 that is something that I don't think any of us will argue, and we'll get to Paul W.S. Anderson in one minute. Before we get too far into this, I am joined by a kind of a Event Horizon-themed beverage tonight. I have a beer from Gigantic Brewing Company. It's called the Boom Pow, because there is a lot of explosions in this film. Uh, it's a hazy IPA out of Oregon, or 7.5 percenter. Uh, it's a bomber of that, so that's what's going to be exploding my ship uh, during this cast. Uh, anyone else partaking? Uh, yes, yes. Tonight's episode is brought to you in part by Knob Creek. Jesus. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> yep. There we go. Okay. I'm over here like, I got a 7.5% beer, do to do. And he's like, I have a laundry soap container full of whiskey. So, okay. <laughs> I'm not. We're, I'm not a nice, a nice H2O. Oh, yeah, nice, I think a lot yeah. of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of it. That actually, 
that's on theme with tonight's movie. Yeah. <laughs> because the floating the CGI we water bottle talk about the special effects. Yeah, you yeah. know, remember that that floating bottle of water in that ship that's frozen. Yeah, right. <laughs> that one. All right, let, let's get right into it. Paul W. S. Anderson. Where do I start? Because this guy, whew, this guy is like a t- he's like the Michael Bay of like sci fi's. He started off with with making his film Shopping. Uh, I haven't seen it, so I can't I can't say if it was good or not. He wrote and directed it. I don't know much about it, but what he kind of exploded on the scene for was 1995's Mortal Kombat, which is a very polarizing film. I I you know I could see that it's kind of dumb, but it's it's fun. It's Mortal Kombat. It's just like you could find enjoyment in that. I think he. He did a good job with that, especially like with the budget he he had to work with as like a, for all intents and purposes a first time studio I mean, director. I think that though with with Mortal Kombat, I think that a lot of people will still argue that that's the best video game movie mm-hmm. ever made. I mean, I, I'd say Sonic the Hedgehog probably took surpassed wow. that finally. That's but, a hot take. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I but I, uh, you know that Mortal Kombat, I think. For those who grew up with that movie, that's yeah. like a it's a it's kind of a staple in in certain households, I'd say. And I actually just rewatched Mortal Kombat just a couple of weeks ago for fun. So <laughs> yeah, and it, and it's still fun, right? It's not it's not groundbreaking. It's not like you know, it's yeah. not Schindler's List, but it's it it's but it's, it's Mortal Kombat. What do you yeah. do with it anyway? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, Gained enough good credit to be handed this. So in 1997, uh, we just did. I just did a a review on the show for the relic that came out the same year. And this came out the same year. It like everything came out in 97 event horizon was released by paramount pictures. Guess what else paramount pictures released that year. That's Titanic. So I love the story that this film was like flying under the radar that he got to get away with so much shit because all the studios execs were like really eyes on Titanic and what James Cameron was doing. You know, they watched the dailies at first and they're like this, this seems pretty brutal. Why don't we scale it back? Is there any chance that we could make it PG-13? He's like, uh, yeah, sure, whatever. you know. And then he just keep shooting like crazy scenes until it was just like too late. It was already like in editing when they're just like, oh, wait, shit, we should probably like kind of pay attention to this. And by that time, it was just like <laughs> way too late. And, and he got to make like a really crazy, brutal movie. When it came to gruesome, like... We can I can fault this movie for some glitches in in how they applied special effects and some continuity where it's like Sam Neill's character is talking or not Sam Neill um Lawrence Fishburne's character talks about how it's a deep freeze in there and it's like a tomb and they cut away and you see this bottle of water with liquid water floating through space <laughs> and I'm like so how that, ice yeah, crystals right. everywhere yeah <laughs> but the water in the bottle is still liquid. Yay! That could have been coolant, like, Johnny. Don't be a dick. We need the special <laughs> effects, like the, you know, going going back. That's only me going back and looking at it with a critical eye because sure. I didn't care about that when I was a teenager, seeing this in the first time, or early twenties, whenever God knows whenever I saw this. But the movie just kind of gripped me. I what I liked about the movie is it had good horror suspense. More <laughs> gruesome was the fact that like so many of the things that happened to the characters it's self-inflicted like it just takes over you and you do crazy things that to yourself mm-hmm. like when uh when what's his name dj not dj um oh, baby bear called? baby bear baby bear goes and puts himself in the airlock <laughs> then yeah. he comes to his senses like mama bear open the door oh yeah just <laughs> oh my god it's just like you know, I and the, and I've seen people criticize it like, ah, this is not exactly what happens to you in like the vacuum of space. Don't care. That's fine. That that was gruesome. Like they needed gruesome, they got gruesome, and they did some. They really had a thing about no eyes in the eye sockets. That was disturbing. Because where we're going, we don't need eyes to see. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. For, for yes, someone that's, that, that's made horror movies, Tony, it, you know, you've at, you're a filmmaker, you you've made these things. Just talk a little bit about the like the practical effects in this and how I mean they they were doing some wire work, but they, you know, they got around a little bit with doing like, oh, we have, you know, gravity boots and stuff. So it it just right. seemed like they were that's, really smart with the budget. 
No, they're, they're definitely really smart with the budget. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out was the gravity boots, like the magnetic boots, because that goes, oh, OK, we can have gravity, but we don't have to explain it because <laughs> yeah. when they're moving around and stuff, I still feel like it wouldn't look as solid as what it does. Uh, but th- whatever, it's beside, beside the point. But as far as what they've accomplished, this movie from when it was greenlit to uh, when it was done was 10 months. Yeah. And that is absolutely incredible with the amount of special effects. Just one special effects scene, just a death on on camera can take so long to film sometimes and just be more of a nuisance. And then when you get into the edit, you just cut out the part anyway and you just show the aftermath. And you're like, why did we spend three hours trying to film this guy get <laughs> shot? When we, could, we were just going to show him dead on the ground anyway. But that's just sometimes how it happens. Yeah. Um, so to be able to to kind of just to to do this in a 10 month span and that's like movie done in 10 months mm-hmm. and wow and when you have those scenes the, all those scenes where they flash to like the crazy orgy thing that's happening and with the original crew right right with the original crew and like the yeah. the guy holding his eyes and and even the stuff later on when Sam Neill gets uh when he like touches Lawrence Fishburne and and sends him into like to see what's going to happen to his crew. And there's all those flashes of everybody Do all cut up. See? That's like hours of makeup and stuff for like two seconds of screen time. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's because he, his original edit was like an hour and 20 minutes long or something like that. And the studio made him cut it down a half hour, but because yep. uh, it was too gory, but, uh, but that's just like an incredible amount of work to achieve in a 10 month period. And, and it looks good. All the, all the stuff for what it needs to do on screen, it conveys, exactly what it's trying to do it's not trying to be anything more or anything deeper than what it than what it is i don't think i think there's some really cool symbolism in the movie uh, and some really cool visuals that that were definitely thought out but i also feel like because like what you said it was a kind of you know under the radar movie with titanic happening they were really able to kind of indie it in a way and uh, treat it as like this more low budget horror movie and just kind of go all out on everything. And I, I just, I, I love that aspect of it. I like how the movie was created more than I actually like the final product, I think. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. They weren't slacking on casting. Oh, like, no, no, not at all. God, like Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne in the late 90s, these guys were hot. They were doing all kinds of, they got Sam Neill is still apparently involved in the Jurassic Park franchise. And then you've got Lawrence Fishburne after this goes on to do The Matrix. Like, they were they were nailing it. And what's the other one? Uh, Jason Isaacs. He mm-hmm. went on to a whole bunch of awesome stuff. So like they weren't they, for casting. They weren't slacking. Like I think they had the right people doing the right stuff. And I was shocked to look at the budget versus what it made. And then I hear Titanic happened that same year. And then I'm less shocked. It's just <laughs> yeah. You know that's 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 what happens on this show. We find the movies that got dwarfed by something massive, and should have gotten more credit than they got. Well, here's what I liked about I want to stay on the cast because that is probably the most interesting part of this film. I love when they put these like crazy indie. Let me back it up. I want to give a lot of credit to Steven Spielberg by putting Laura Dern of like David Lynch movie fame. You have Jeff Goldblum as like the Brundle fly in in Cronenberg's The Fly, and then you put Sam Neill that is always in the, the, like a crazy role. Like he was in The Omen Three, he was in Possession. Crazy like unhinged Sam Neill is best Sam Neill. Like his performance in this is and it's polarizing, which I don't get. Like a lot of people don't like how like weird Sam Neill gets in this, and I feel like they it, it's just like moviegoers that just expect him to be you know dr grant from jurassic park but like if you've seen like in the mouth of madness from john carpenter you're just like no this is like what sam neill does best and fishburn like you said was a perfect person to kind of put in as the pov character because he's such a grounded uh almost like a younger like morgan freeman-esque where he's like he has that soothing voice and he's just like yeah we're in the middle of it but we're gonna be okay type thing uh but like sam neill is just he just completely steals this entire movie and and tony going back to the the effects like you said he would sit there put that uh like when he went full brundle fly or whatever you know full weir i guess they would put him in a he would have to stand naked and they put him in a full like body skin cast and then put like all those markings on him and all that fake blood it would take eight hours just to get in the fucking suit where he would have to like 
like take a break because he's like it was freezing in that in that uh, studio where the the spinning you know gyroscope thing is you'd have to like go like stand by a heater and then the heater would dry out the blood and then you'd have to like start over again he's like it was the worst two weeks of my life it was like literally hell like getting in that thing but he was just so happy with the with the results like everyone even though this movie totally kind of bombed the people that made it and the people that and the actors in it like hold it still to such high esteem i think this is the only film that i've really properly seen sam neill go full tilt creepy oh, like it, it's kind of like you can tell it's right under the surface at the beginning of the movie and as he gets further in it's like he's got this like weird compulsion he needs to be on that ship Let's do kind of a quick pl plot synopsis tony what is event horizon about kind of starts out by ripping off alien and uh, <laughs> you got a crew on board that has to go investigate a uh, another ship, and it's because this and that's their their whole mission is is a, a ship uh, went missing seven years previous. It has a, an engine in it that is basically harnesses the power of a black hole, allowing it to kind of bamp through space and time. Uh, disappears, reappears seven years later, and this ship is going to go investigate it. Uh, along with the guy who did he make it? Did Samuel's character create the ship? Yes, yes, the, yes. Definitely in the pro, like you know, one of the guys involved in 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 all that. Um, I think this movie might have created the film trope of how to explain how wormholes and and space travel works by folding two pieces of paper and punching a pencil through it. Yeah, because uh, they do that in like mm -hmm. every movie ever now. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then all hell breaks loose. Basically, I mean, it, they basically they. They combine Alien with Doom, and uh, it's the movie. <laughs> See, I, yes, I, I got literally more like, like ha haunted I, house in outer space too. Yeah, yeah, definitely haunted house in outer space is is a uh, is something a uh, is I mean definitely a way to discuss it. I mean it's it's very haunted house. It's very possession. You know, I mean it's uh, it's got all those creepy vibes that you would get from a haunted house kind of movie. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not Alien by any means. It like in the sense of being attacked by aliens or, or being other life in the universe kind of thing. It's nothing like that. It's very much haunted house feel, but in space and the sci-fi side of the stuff in it is pretty cool. And yeah. is actually like, I mean, they have their, you know, their, their mishaps here and there, but them actually trying to stay legit within a sci-fi world. Uh, I think I applaud them on that because yeah. for me personally, that's one of my more favorite genres is sci-fi. And that's why I like things like Alien when they cross into the horror realm. And this this one, for the first, you know, 20, 30 minutes, it's a pretty much just a straightforward sci-fi movie right. with a little bit of, you know, hints at creepiness. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Tony brings up Doom. Like you mentioned Doom, and that's one of the things that pops into my mind when I hear some of the sound effects involved in, like, mm. the exploding fire. Mm -hmm. I swear to God they pulled some of those from the Doom, like, video game franchise just to put the pieces together. That was pretty, yeah. I, I enjoyed that. The, I thought, the <laughs> doors when they open sound like the doors that open in, in Doom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised sound. if they had like, they had gotten some of the rights to those those little uh, sound bites to put into the movie. That that was, um, maybe they were going for that Doom crowd. As far as like explaining the sci-fi, like we had some characters in here that were just like us. Like Cooper was such a great character, uh, played by Richard T. Jones, because he is just like, I'm just here to kind of like fix the normal stuff, but like no one knows what the hell you're talking about. Even Lawrence Fishburne, everyone's just like, tell us what the hell is going on. You built this ship. Like you're responsible, we're to like t tell us what's going on. And, and, and he's constantly just like, oh, well, it's it's just, it's too much to fathom, blah, blah. He's like, no, we got like 48 hours, like fucking start talking. So everyone, like the characters are so believable unlike like a Star Trek or but that's Star the, Wars. I, I could probably disagree with you okay. there, though, John, because it drives me insane how he has to explain everything to this crew of astronauts. They should understand how a lot of this stuff works. And they didn't do a mission brief before yeah. they went into cryosleep, like <laughs> yeah. they wake up in cryosleep yeah. and I then do a that. mission brief. Yeah, We're going to go yeah. into stasis first, then we'll wake up. <laughs> Then we'll have travel for 57 days, and then I'll tell you what you're here for. <laughs> that okay, I'll, I'll, I'll totally concede that point. You know, put yourself in that position where it's just like 
you start seeing weird shit, and, and you know, some of the other officers, uh, especially the medical ones, are just like, well, you know, it, we're, we're having problems with the with the circulation, and it might just be like carbon monoxide. That's why we're hallucinating. It just seemed very real conversation as far as that goes. As far as the mission briefing goes, yeah, I wouldn't get on a boat, you know, to, to Neptune without knowing why. F- totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the, the critical error they made was clamping down on that one antenna array with the arm, with the clamp, the arm from the, the Lewis like, and Clark. This isn't a load-bearing structure. He's like, it is now. Yeah, it is now. <laughs> and that's when they pissed off the ship. That's what happened. Like, they, they, they scratched the paint. And right there, it's like you sent a ship through a wormhole and it came back as a crazy sociopath. It doesn't take a lot. There it was. So this that's is basically Christine the, you know, in space. <laughs> Basically, yeah, there you go. there's a lot of parallels here. You you can you can definitely draw some lines of inspiration. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of Shining too, uh, and not just because the the yes. the blood flood scene, but there is just a lot of that. You know, you don't know what's real. Uh, the ship taking over your your mind and stuff like that. I, I felt like this was a lot of Kubrick in here. So. But it wasn't. It wasn't like a lot of directors do that, especially when the, when you get to horror, where you see all these, all the spaghettis on the wall, and it's just like, oh, that's from Friday the Thirteenth, or oh, they took that from Alien, or blah blah blah. But this wasn't so blatant ripoffs. It was just a nice homage where I think it just kind of came together in like a perfect stew, and it was still I its agree. own thing. No, I, I I totally agree, and I, I I that's what I give it props to being is that I think they set out to make this exact movie. Like I know that he had to cut like thirty minutes off of it or whatever, right. but I think that the final product of this film is pretty much exactly what they were going for. I mean, it was paying homage to to you know horror movies that you know that obviously that the director liked and the writers were into, but but it's also its own thing, and that's everything. I mean, watch any Tarantino movie; it rips off. Every like it rips off tons of movies that you know are from the 60s and 70s and right. movies from Japan and things like that. Like uh, Star Wars, you know, the first Star Wars film is a complete ripoff of like a Japanese samurai film. Mm-hmm. Like that. So I mean, there. This is what this is art. That's art imitating other art. So I think that as a whole, this movie ends up being its own thing, despite being able to point out definitely where all the influences came from. I think I like the fact that they really tapped into that creepy horror vibe and you, you got less with more you got more with less here that was what happened like why was that what was that pounding on the door there could be some kind of cavitations and changes in temperature and everybody in the theater is going bullshit <laughs> yeah. no, that doesn't happen with claws trying to dig through a giant airlock door no well, that's not how that works well, stuff like that is what drives me nuts about the movie. Like at the like right towards the end, uh, when I think it's what is it? Lawrence Fishburne's like like about to attack Sam Neill, and Sam Neill holds that gun against them, and he's like, "If you miss, you'll blow out the hole." And he's like, "Who says I'm gonna miss?" And then like the dude's at the window, and he shoots the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, I just don't understand. Oopsie <laughs> Daisy. <laughs> Look, He's outside. He can't do anything <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what about that horror rage? And look, uh, gravity completely ripped off Event Horizon because Cooper, when he, when he he's like jettisoned. Uh, from the the initial blast, and he's like floating through space. He's the one that empties his oxygen tank. I'm like, ah, even uh, uh, Alfonso Cuarón, who won an Academy Award for Gravity, he he, uh, you know, got that from he aped it from Event Horizon. So it's not just Event Horizon that's taken from you know the the buffet <laughs> of of sci-fi yeah, yeah, horror. Yeah, well, did, I mean, did he do it better than Event Horizon? Because you, you, I saw that scene. I was like looking at that again. I was like, wait a second. He's just been jettisoned into space. You can. Like, you can't even see the ship. He's so far out. You can see Neptune. Like, this ship was at Neptune's, like, almost in the atmosphere. And then, all of a sudden, Cooper's all the way out there. He's going to jettison his tank, and he's going back. I'm sorry. Johnny. Who makes that? It's, it's can... fine, because he did it while saying, I'm coming, motherfucker! <laughs> right. Okay. See, that makes that there. Now, but... You, this is you why I'm to, not an astronaut need... because I don't know what to say yeah. to make all my trajectories and calculations and all the things exactly. that require exactly. like high powered computers. It to took the every man. It took the every man. Yeah. It took the every man. And only the every man can do that. Correct. 
you know, Event Horizon didn't also inspire or didn't just inspire Gravity. You have to think about, uh, I think, a definite inspiration is Dead Space. I don't yes. know if you guys have played that video game franchise, yeah. but I think that there's probably a lot of Event Horizon throughout those games. Those games terrify me. I always <laughs> felt like this was, that, like Dead Space was Event Horizon the game. I, I Like, it completely is almost scene for scene in, in some of the spots. Uh, absolutely. Which makes a lot of sense because, like, think about what Paul W.S. Anderson would go on to do. He would go on to front the... Resident Evil franchise, which is what a survival horror. So it just they're just like, oh wow, like you n- nailed this perfectly, and then they created a game franchise out, you know, after your movie, and you know because this was this was like he doesn't get a lot more credit than he deserves because he was so young. I think he turned like. 30 years old. This is going to make us sick, Tony. Like, he turned 30 <laughs> years old while he was making this fucking film, little clip that they were celebrating his birthday, and Lawrence Fishburne was, you know, lighting the, the candles on the cake. So he was super young. So he didn't even know, like, that he was supposed to, like, do a director's cut, you know, all that. And then by the time that he's just like, okay, this has a life after the theatrical release, even though the theatrical relief release was pretty poor. He's like, people want to see this, but by the time that they tracked down the extra footage for his cut, they stored it in a salt mine, and it ruined everything. This film was like lightning in a bottle, and I'm not saying it's the best film of all time, but the fact that he got the right people, the fact that he pushed back with no real reason to to be able to, because he was so young and so inexperienced, to, to, the, uh, to the studio, to Paramount of all people, and Paramount was just like, we want a, we want the bad guys to be aliens. He's like, no. What if we do an allegoric spin on this? And or Proxima Centauri, it went to it literally went to hell. And we and we introduced like crazy religion into the sci-fi. And and I think that's what kind of set it apart from everything and and, and made it well. I guess made it even more like Star Wars, like an evil version of Star Wars. But uh, the, you know, and, and he like held his foot down on on that pedal because the the ship itself is shaped like a cross like the the pillars inside like all the set design looks very cathedral like the idea to not just make another alien is the bad guy movie with a derelict ship and, and he decided to go allegory was was what allowed this film to have a life after after its theatrical release i think they even hint in the movie or samuel's character hints in the movie it's not just hell it's not even it's beyond that it is something that that can't be fathomed like whatever the concept was on earth doesn't even scratch the surface of where this ship went to like this ship didn't even go to proxima centauri it went to another dimension i like the the symbolism is definitely there but i think they're hinting at there's something even bigger and further beyond what the typical understanding would have been so that i I like that take on it that seemed like a fun kind of like this gets darker than you could ever imagine yeah and we're not going to show you everything i think that all of that can be a little heavy-handed at times within the movie but also has some really amazing visuals Uh, i love the silhouette in front of the cross-shaped window a lot Mm -hmm. and i love uh i love to hate all of the spikes there's a lot of spikes (laughs) <laughs> yeah that was There's that was fight. weird i'm like i had i did wonder like in the gravity drive room what why what was it what is yeah. it about why make this room where engineers have to go and fix things literally a death trap <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know I, I felt like since weir was the engineer of this it, for the context of the character it took over his life so much that his own wife committed suicide because he was just doing this thing. Put himself in the role of God, and that's why I think you got these like sweeping hallways that look like a cathedral and, and these type of things where that design makes sense because he, ha- he, the character, has some sort of God complex. So I think that's... Oh, for sure. I, I don't know. I, I think that's what made sense. Is it is it now like a little cute that it wound up going to hell? Uh, sure, you know. There's a there's a there is plot holes in this, but it I mean this film fucks hard. Like <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like a, a nice little anecdote to the you know to to the symbolism and and definitely like the effort put into this story. Uh, the um, event horizon itself is a theoretical boundary around a black hole beyond which no light or other radiation can escape. So it's the point of no return is what event horizon means. 
uh, which I think is just a it's a nice little anecdote because it's it's literally the point in a black hole that moves it's mo things are moving you know faster than the speed of light so you can't escape it the kind of stuff that I, I like and the kind of things that I try to do in my writing but it's also the kind of stuff that holds me back the most because I'm like what's this character's name gonna be it's got to be something that means something it can't just be John or Jack or whatever but it but I'm currently writing a story where I'm just just letting it go. <laughs> I'm just let, I'm just writing. <laughs> Another comparison that could be made, this was a, a film that came out after it was Sunshine, directed by Danny Boyle, and it runs a lot of parallels uh, to Event Horizon. It, albeit it's a better film, uh, I, I know you guys said you, you haven't seen Sunshine yet, but it is, it's, it's kind of similar, but it, it also is its own thing. I think that this is a way more overtly gory and brutal film this is more you know body horror and like in your face where the where sunshine's a little bit more psychological so it's made really well it's a danny boyle film tony you seem to be the the most kind of critical of this film what do you think were the biggest things that didn't work and why do you think it was such a disaster in the box office um i mean i think it was a disaster in the box office i mean that's hard it's hard to say because it's 1997 um but I mean, obviously, I mean, if Titanic came out that same year, I don't, it's it's hard to say really, you know, on that side of things, why it didn't do so great in the box office as far as pe people's audience, like it could have been marketing and things like that. I mean, it had it had people in it, but maybe not people that I mean, it had Sam Neill and Lawrence Fisherman, but they weren't exactly Hollywood A-listers at that time. Uh, you know, they would go on to be for sure. But I think that as far as the movie goes, I think it sets up a really great premise. It's really interesting, but I think that that premise kind of falls apart when all of this, when when shit hits the fan, and it's and that's when it's gonna it's going to kind of divide people. You're gonna have people that are within the horror community that thoroughly enjoy that side of things and are gonna love it and eat it up. And that's why if you look at the audience score for the film, Rotten Tomatoes is 61%. And the critic score is 27. And that's because from a critic standpoint, I can totally understand why the movie, it does, it falls apart when, when things start to get violent and it, it, it's continuity errors like crazy. Uh, it doesn't really stick to its own rules that it sets up sometimes. Uh, and it also doesn't necessarily have like a solid narrative. I think once, once they board the ship, uh, it's just now it's a haunted house and it's like spooky things are happening and stuff, mm -hmm. but we don't really get like like a real just A to B narrative through that, which isn't a bad thing. It's just makes it not necessarily hard to follow, but kind of boring in a sense too mm. in moments. Like you don't really I don't find myself caring about anybody, and that's the problem. I don't care about any of the characters. Like they're, I know that they're all going to die. I know that they're in the movie to die. The whole purpose of there being a crew of people is to just kill them off. Sure. Uh, so I don't, I, I, I found myself not really enjoying a lot of the characters. And I think that Sam Neill is good in his role and he's doing exactly what uh, Paul W.S. Anderson wants him to do. But I also think that his performance is heavy handed and at moments is uh, just, it's just a little too over the top. Wow. But, um, but I think the movie is fun and that's what I think that they were going for trying to make a groundbreaking film. I don't, I mean, I don't think, right. Hopefully not, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that they made the movie they were trying to make is what I like when I watch the movie, I'm not really criticizing it for that. Like I'm, I'm, I know that this is what they wanted to do. And so in my mind, that's a, that's a good movie. It like, I don't care. Movies aren't all always for me. You know, it's like sure. Beverly Hills Chihuahua is not a movie that I care about. <laughs> but I think that those filmmakers made the exact movie that they wanted to make. Yeah. And so that's a win. Yeah. Uh, man, Tony and I have not disagreed this much since uh, our Labyrinth review uh, from like episode <laughs> three. Uh, Johnny, where do you stand on? Do you think it holds up? What do you think it's so polarizing as a film? I think listening to, to Tony talk about it, it, it definitely, the genre and the fan base was probably very specific. And it was sci-fi horror. And I think it hit all the marks for the sci-fi horror scene. 
but when it came to the everyday viewer who needed a scare if i'm you know i went to imdb and went looking at what this was up against and there are yeah right 97 had all kind 1997 had a ton you not yeah. just titanic you've got and in, this is the top, this is like in the top 20 for IMDb, the popularity. Starship Troopers, Boogie Nights, Titanic, Batman and Robin, The Fifth Element, which The Fifth Element being another favorite of mine. I definitely went to the theaters to see that one. Mm -hmm. um, Vegas Vacation, I didn't even realize that was 97. There's a ton of movies. And even after all that, as far as popularity goes, this shows up in the top 20. So I... Based on what Tony's saying, as far as like from the critics and maybe the general public heard the reviews from critics and were like, meh, I'm going to go watch Titanic or I'm going to go watch something else. Something else is more more appealing to what I want to see. And oh, another one. Goodwill Hunting happened in 97. Yeah. They had a lot of headwinds. So between the flaws in the movie being one of the first ones by Anderson and the fact that they had all of these other blockbuster hits in that same year. It's just, you know, those those components combined probably didn't do it any justice. And it is a cult following that that loved it. Like when I did see it, it stuck with me. Yeah. Like I I didn't go in when I was when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I wasn't going with the critical eye. It scared the crap out of me. It was awesome sci-fi. It was Lawrence Fishburne and Sam Neill. And I like I knew the like they had I, I liked the characters, I liked the actors, and it did its job. And I think that's what I think that's where it succeeds. For everything we can pick apart about this movie, it still did its job. And it sent the director off to do other movies that continue to do their jobs and do them better and i think that's that's where this movie wins it's like yeah we can gig it but it's not gonna it didn't tank so badly that people like this didn't ruin any careers of the actors in this movie right like you right. go through and look at these actors they went on like the the main character some of the main actors that were in this movie continue to do work to this very day i didn't i didn't realize sam neil was in ragnarok yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, he's he's, uh, he, he's 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 actor Odin. I yeah, thought that Odin. was Rick Torn. I didn't realize <laughs> that was Sam Neill. So like, they are these are. It, it wasn't such a flop that it tanked someone's career, which we have talked about in this series. Like, sure. there are movies where people's careers were. This didn't Chris cried. Elliott anybody. Yeah, poor Chris right. Elliott. He didn't, is... he didn't deserve the hate. <laughs> right. It's an incredibly ambitious film that they pulled off. The the movie the the only thing that it really for I mean as far as like if I'm you know criticizing it it just for me it just comes down to the story and I just think that uh, I think that you know they could have could have been a little bit better elaborated I think that they use the excuse of with Sam Neill's character of not like like you guys wouldn't understand it so I'm not gonna really explain it because they didn't really want to explain it very much sure which is totally fine. Yeah. Like, because sometimes it's like that, you know, in Alien, you don't see the alien very much because it makes it scarier. You don't want to overly explain what's going on because who cares? That's just, it's hell on a ship. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which is, which is fine. But I, but I also think that that, you know, kind of hurts it. Uh, th this was, uh, it was, I, I think it was too brutal for people because of the other, and to be fair, this was just the, couple of sci-fi films that Johnny listed off that came out this year this is the third best sci-fi you know the, there there was just it was just such a stacked deck and I think that's why you know when you when you compare you know vivisection to to other like popcorn movies yeah you know we're, we're gonna take you know the, the the wife or the or the boyfriend or whatever to go see to go see that and not just get completely grossed out this was probably one of the most promising young filmmaking careers in Paul W.S. Anderson making Mortal Kombat then going in Event Horizon and then he just literally kind of kept his wife employed Mila Jovovich you know making a, a bunch of horrible Resident Evil films and it's just like it, it, it just really frustrates you because he definitely had a vision whether you know it, it translated in this or, or not as, as well as I think it does or as well as Tony doesn't think it does or whatever it it really said something, and it really said something that he had such uh, control over this with with the amount, uh, with, with the huge studio backing, with uh, with the actors that he had, 
I think my, my biggest complaints about the film is it, it's about 10, 15 minutes too short. I feel like we could kind of iron out some of those story points if we actually got a little bit more time. This is a, a brisk 96 minutes, Look, and I mean, and it's over. Hey, if I could watch, if I could, I'm, I'm not, I don't hate this movie. If yeah, I could watch, yeah, yeah. If, his, if he was able to have the footage and, and release a director's cut, I would watch that director's cut. Mm. I would, I'm curious to what his real vision was. But as a director, this guy's just made a whole line of terrible movies. I yeah. mean, he's making all the Resident <laughs> Evil garbage, like Death Race, um, The Three Musketeers, and Pompeii. Like, I mean, none of these movies are great movies. They're all just all right, though. None of them are all... They're, they're not terrible. Garbage is the wrong word. They're not terrible movies. They're all just perfectly fine movies. Really, <laughs> I mean, really. You know? Resident Evil <laughs> Retribution is pretty fucking terrible. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, sure. But like, you know, and Pompeii sucks. But yeah. it's like, it doesn't suck that bad. I've seen right. worse movies. It's not the room. Know? Like, the Three Musketeers. Like, I've got friends that really like that movie. I don't really like that movie at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, it's sort of the, oh, so the category is, yeah, could be worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's if you a, want somebody to make just like a like a slightly trashy, but gonna probably make some money. Perfectly all right movie for theaters and for audiences <laughs> this is your guy <laughs> I mean, alien like, versus predator is not great but right. it's cool <laughs> <laughs> get to see a predator punch an alien in the face you know what else you want yeah. like it has no, no continuity whatsoever with any of the other movies right but it's a cool movie to watch and it's not the sequel the sequel's garbage <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly okay yeah yeah this tra- this all I hear is like this trash fire over here. That's fine. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> Don't sweat it. it. It's like it's like two day old Chinese food, right? It's just like <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's still kind of good, but I yeah. I might get the runs from it, but it's worth it's worth it. You know, I don't know. Worth uh, the risk. Hey, and I'll, actually, I, I I will say that I do enjoy Soldier. That's that's a movie. Of his oh movie. yeah. Oh okay. <laughs> uh, We're finding out a lot about. <laughs> Tony Walters on this. Uh, uh, people, so. people don't like that movie. I know that that's a movie that a lot of people don't like, but I think it's a cool. I think it's a cool movie. It's a perfectly <laughs> okay movie. <laughs> it's a perfectly okay movie. <laughs> it's, fine. it's all fine. It's all just perfectly <laughs> mediocre. It's funny that his wife was in the better one of those sci-fi's this this year that came out this year, uh, Fifth Element too. But yeah, it, yeah, it is what it is. It, I that. I would recommend this to. I would I would really recommend this to to anyone that is a fan of the genre, rather, whether that be a horror or sci-fi. Maybe not if you're just like oh, you know, if you ask someone what sci-fi to you, uh, Star Wars and Star Trek. Maybe not mention Event Horizon because this is this is a this is not your dad's sci-fi. This is a little grosser. This is a little dirtier. This is more of like a Cronenberg body horror type film. And, and it, if if he had it his way, it would have been a lot worse. We would have gotten like the full unedited version of like the the prior cruise like video and like found footage and all that. So, but you know what we still got? People were passing out at the test screening. So. It is a, a horribly disturbing film. Uh, it will, like Johnny said, it does stick with you. I think no matter what age, you will still be thinking about it, even if not all the pieces fall into place perfectly. So I, I think that this was, like Tony said, Paul W. S. Anderson's uh, best film by far. Even though Mortal Kombat is fun, I think from start to finish, this is this is a great film from him. And everything else, eh, it's just kind of ho hum. So See, you, uh, you know what's funny is I think that the second half of Event Horizon is like its issues that I have with it are the same issues that I have with Mortal Kombat as a whole, which is like okay. <laughs> all these characters with different story, like different through lines that we keep bouncing back between. Yeah. But every time we bounce back to them, they're in some place new that we don't know or haven't seen before, sure. and their yeah. continuity is just like a little weird. Like. Now we're going to fight these guys in the woods, but is this part of the tournament or is this not part of the tournament? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to do the scorpion uh, spear thing, so it doesn't matter if it makes sense. we got to do it. Get 
over here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, with that said, if we convince you that Event Horizon is one of the best sci-fi horror films of all time, or is it just like all the other Paul W.S. Anderson films and just pretty okay, just kind of non-offensive, let us know in the comments below. If you like this, uh, you could hit the thumbs up button. You could tell your friends that we're reviewing videos here on the Cult of Films. You could share this around because that is a free way to support the favorite content creators that you consume. I want to thank my special panel on this one uh, mr johnny mulligans where can everyone find you uh you can find me lurking around here and you can find me on twitter at johnny mulligans and there you go and there you go uh mr tony walters the curmudgeon of the episode award goes to no <laughs> uh look into that <laughs> camera sir tell everyone what you're up to any upcoming projects and where to find you um, not a whole lot of upcoming projects. We do have a, a short film we'll be shooting this fall called Idol Girl. I don't know that we've officially announced. Oh no, we did. We've we've, we've announced it. Ooh, and then we've got uh, <laughs> um, uh, we got some stuff we're working on for our feature parallels. Uh, we'll be working on that next week. Just uh, doing some previs stuff. But you can find me at uh, radentertain.com. and uh, get on there and check out our merch because uh, we've got some cool clothes targeted directly towards filmmakers so we got shirts that are shirts that are unique and interesting and are actually changing this week so if you want to get on there and get what's available now do it because it's going to be gone soon and then there'll be new stuff i don't know when you <laughs> i don't know when you're actually putting this out so right, yeah. there'll be things <laughs> radentertain.com slash rad threads for for some sweet merch <laughs> very cool, very cool. If you want to follow this, uh, we are at The Cult of Films, all undercase. If you want to check out the other movie podcast we do, that's at uh, film underscore hooligans. Or if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm just simply at John the Host. Uh, so until next time, any pretty okay, like kind of, you know, mediocre, non-offensive <laughs> outros we could do? <laughs> I got <nothing. laughs> We will see you next time. <laughs>